entire family featuring many of the world's leading creationist speakers. They will answer your questions about creation and evolution and will demonstrate that the book of Genesis is reliable and vitally important. Okay, in this session, we're going to be talking on the topic of the importance of this whole creation-evolution issue. As we said, many people see creation-evolution as a side issue. There are many more important issues, they say. Why not combat homosexuality, abortion, lawlessness? People don't seem to listen to the gospel much these days. Uh, they just scoff or mock, and particularly Australians are good at doing that, scoffing and mocking at Christians. But as I said to you, creation-evolution is foundational to all of those issues. And to introduce that, let's then start with the word of one who knows everything has always been there and start with the book of Genesis. And let's just look at a, a couple of aspects here first up. It, for instance, tells us that God created everything in six days. And by the way, I believe they're ordinary days. And in one of the uh, sessions that I'm doing for you following on from these, I'm going to talk more about those days as ordinary days. Let me just mention a couple of things very quickly here. I believe they are ordinary days for a number of reasons. One is in Exodus 20 verse 11 we're told that God made everything in six days and rested for one and so we're to do the same. He didn't say he made everything in six million years and rested for one million years so we're to do the same. Uh, he also tells us that he made Adam on day six and Adam uh, lived through day six and day seven and died when he was 930 years old. So if each day is a million years or a thousand years you've got some problems. And by the way, if they're not ordinary days, what are they? Well, the answer is you don't know. They could be anything. Because the only other w meaning for the word day is an indefinite period of time. So if they're not ordinary days, what are they? You don't know. They could mean anything. So if you don't know what they are, can you say I'm wrong when I say they're ordinary days? The answer is no, because you don't know what they are. I do. You've got the problem, not me. <laughs> now... As I said, in one of the future sessions we'll deal with that in more detail but I believe God created everything in six days on day six it tells us that he made land animals and man and I thought you might be interested in a photograph that Eve took to show you what actually happened there <laughs> uh, and that is if he made land animals and man on day six we see koala bears and tyrannosaurus and uh, wombats and kangaroos and Adam there with a smile on his face and of course Eve Adam had just invented the Polaroid camera which is why we can have this photograph uh, See, we do have a witness from the past. Now, don't believe that, do you? <laughs> but if God did make land animals and man on day six, that's one of the implications. Dinosaurs and man lived at the same time. We'll talk more about that when we do the session on the true history of the world. But there's one important point I want to mention here as we lead into the importance of this issue. Why wouldn't the dinosaur have eaten up Adam or eaten up some of the other animals? The biblical picture tells us in Genesis 1, 29 and 30 that animals and man were vegetarian. In fact, you were created to be a vegetarian. What did you have for tea last night? Now I've got you worried, haven't I? No? <laughs> Except you realize that in uh, Genesis 9, after Noah's flood, we're told we could eat meat. But of course, originally, we we're created to be vegetarian. And so are the animals. Originally, everything was perfect. There was no death in the world. Now, the Bible teaches quite clearly that death came only after Adam sinned. In fact, you could look up Romans 5.12 and 1 Corinthians 15 and Genesis 3. There are many other passages in Scripture. Man's actions led to sin, which led to death. And that death is not just spiritual death, it's also physical death. 1 Corinthians 15 talked about the death of the first Adam and compares it to the death of the last Adam. And who was the last Adam? Jesus Christ. And he didn't just die, he, he died physically too, didn't he? And so it's in re relation to Adam it's talking about spiritual death that's true but it's also talking about physical death in fact the Bible tells us from dust they came to dust they will return it was obviously talking about physical death in fact Romans 5:12 tells us it was death general death of man and the animals now have to think about this for a moment the biblical teaching I believe is clear that death came after Adam sinned there was no death in the world before Adam sinned. 
The animals only ate plants. Plants were made for food. In fact, that's what we're told. Plants were given for food. But the animals didn't eat each other. The animals only ate plants. Now, think very carefully about this because it's a very, very important point. If death came into the world after Adam sinned, why did death come into the world? Why did God curse the world with death? Adam and Eve were created perfect. Everything was good. The biblical description there is everything is good. And of course, what good means <coughs> is that, well, the only way to define good is on the basis of one who is good. You must have an absolute, mustn't you? And of course, the Bible tells us there is, the only one who is good is God. What are the attributes of God? His attributes aren't, uh, let's see, survival of the fittest, nature, red in tooth and in claw, uh, get rid of the weak, eliminate the diseased. That doesn't fit, does it? But certainly, a description of a world where everything is perfect and the animals only ate plants, there was no violence, there was no death, that certainly fits the description of good, doesn't it? When God made everything, it was good. Adam and Eve had a choice. They rebelled against God. That rebellion is called sin. That's where sin comes from. This rebellion against God and his will way back there in the Garden of Eden. As a result, man was cut off from God. He died spiritually. He would have been cut off forever. Imagine living in our sinful states forever, separated from God. But God didn't want that. He wanted man to spend eternity with him. So what did he do? Something very wonderful. See, the Bible also tells us, doesn't it, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. God requires the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. What did God do? He placed upon man the curse of death so he had to die. So first of all, we can leave this sinful body. And then he came in the person of Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless son of God, who suffered the same curse of death on a cross, who shed his blood, who was raised from the dead. So those who trust in him as Lord and Saviour, as the one who was a perfect sacrifice for their sin of rebellion, can spend eternity with him. Tremendous message, isn't it? The message of Christianity, the message of salvation. Do you realise that if you believe in evolution, it says death and struggle over millions of years brought man into existence? That death has always been here. Nature, red in tooth and in claw, survival of the fittest, animals fighting for survival, elimination of the weak, the diseased, in this onward upward struggle for the evolution of life. You know, there are many, many Christians who say, well, you can believe in evolution and you can add it to the Bible. Well, you know, if you take the Bible at its word, it's saying death came into the world only after Adam sinned. You can't have death and struggle for millions of years before man. And there are many other reasons too. You think about it, doesn't Acts 3.21 tell us there's going to be a restitution or restoration? Aren't we taught that one day this world that is going to be renewed, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth? Isn't it going to be put back to what it used to be? It's going to be restored, put back to what it used to be. Doesn't Paul tell us there's something dreadfully wrong with this world, the whole of creation groans and travaileth in pain because of Adam's sin? In other words, there's something wrong with this world. Have a look at it, there's something wrong with it. You know, the evolutionists, think about it. When they look at it, what's wrong with it? Nothing. Because if evolution has occurred over millions of years, what the evolutionist, the atheistic evolutionist says, what you see today in the death, the struggle for survival and so on, that's all a part of evolution. That's why we can say evolution has occurred over millions of years. Incidentally, if you're a Christian and believe in evolution, you have to believe evolution's happening today because that's the very basis of evolutionary thinking, that what you see today are the mechanisms for evolution. So you can't say God used evolution and now it's not happening. That's just totally inconsistent. That means you don't understand evolution. You have to say evolution is happening today. The world you see today is the same world there's been for millions of years, and so it'll be the same world for millions of years into the future too, won't it? You see, if this world's going to be restored and you're an evolutionist, what's it going to be restored to? whatever it is today, because that's what it's been for millions of years. Yet the description in Isaiah 11 and Revelation is what? There'll be no more curse, no more death, no more suffering. The lion and the lamb and the little child, they'll, they'll all be there together and, and the animals will eat straw. And Isn't that a description of no death, no violence, vegetarian? That's a description that fits with Genesis before the fall, but it's not a description that fits with today's world. In fact, when you think about it very carefully, if there was death and bloodshed before Adam sinned, I believe that makes nonsense of the message of redemption. God instituted death and bloodshed really as the means by which man would be redeemed. And so if death and bloodshed existed before then, then the whole message of the cross is undermined. And I believe that every time evolution is taught, it undermines the whole message of the cross. And that's a very serious thing indeed. 
think of some of the scientific implications as we go on through this series. If death came only after Adam's sin, dinosaurs couldn't have died out 70 million years before man. In fact, you couldn't have had any fossils formed before man sinned. So your fossils must have been formed after Adam sinned. And so therefore, as a scientist, I have to be consistent. How could I explain all these billions of dead things around the earth in layers, sometimes miles thick, that were laid down by water, and it has to be after Adam's sin? I think it's very simple. It's called Noah's Flood. And we're going to look at that in detail during this series. For the Christian who say you can believe in evolution in the Bible, I'd say that if you are a Christian and you believe that, you're very inconsistent. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, and I believe you are undermining the message of the cross. Incidentally, in some uh, places this doesn't go down too well, but let me just say it. I want you to think carefully about this. The gap theory is a fairly prevalent theory among certain uh, uh, churches. And I believe the gap theorist has a problem here too. Because if you believe there was a pre-Adamic race which was judged by a flood called Lucifer's Flood, and that the fossils we see today and um, remains of dinosaurs are from that time, you've got a, a number of problems. One is, death came into the world only after Adam sinned. How could you have death before Adam? You see, Adam's sin was reflected in the whole of the universe because the whole of creation groans and travails in pain. Why? Because of Adam's sin, not because of any previous thing. And by the way, if you are a gap theorist, remember that the substance of light wasn't created until what, uh, on day one, on Genesis 1, 3 or 4, and which means it all happened in the dark anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> death was certainly the curse but death you realize is the cure death is the curse that God placed upon the world but at the same time it was the cure in this sense when God placed the curse of death upon Adam he was saying no to what Adam did but you realize at the same time he was saying yes to humanity I love you I want you to spend eternity with me and so in that sense shouldn't we praise God for death the fact that because he did that, we can be redeemed. And so the answer to why is there death and struggle in the world is because God is a God of love and he wants us to spend eternity with him. That's where the non-Christians get it wrong. God must be an ogre. Look at the death and suffering. No, God's a God of love. The reason for death is so we can spend eternity with him. And at the same time, it's a judgment because of our sin. And we must recognize that. You know... In John 5, 45 to 47, we read Jesus Christ speaking. In verse 47, he says, If you don't believe the writings of Moses, how can you believe my words? You know that in uh, Luke, Abraham is quoted as saying, If they don't believe what Moses wrote, neither will they be persuaded even if one rose from the dead. In fact, do you realize right through the New and Old Testament, there's many references to the writings of Moses? Why did Jesus say, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, how can you believe my words? Do you know that there's more references to one book in the writings of Moses than any other in the entire Bible? Have a guess which book. Genesis. Wasn't hard, was it? Genesis is the most quoted from or referred to book in the entire Bible. It's also the most scoffed at, mocked at, ridiculed, disbelieved, thrown out, stood on, allegorized, mythologized, ripped apart, or whatever. <laughs> takes you three days in front of a mirror to practice that. But. In other words, the book that's the most quoted from or referred to is the book that's the most scoffed or mocked at or disbelieved, allegorized or whatever. Why is that so? A very, very important verse of scripture, and I believe it very much applies to our nation of Australia today. Psalm 11 verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I want to look at that verse in detail. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You see, let's take a typical Australian house. <laughs> now, you don't believe me, do you? Actually, when I was in America, and I said that's a typical American house, they didn't believe me either. But when I put this one up and said, no, I'm wrong, this is a typical American house, they really did believe me. <laughs> if you know anything about American culture, everyone has a, uh, a car, uh, the dog and the cat included. In fact, parked around Dr. Gary Parker's house, I think there's how many cars, Gary? <laughs> Seven or eight, nine, ten. <laughs> And only two of them work. But if you, uh, <laughs> if you take a structure and you rip out the foundation of a structure, what happens? It collapses. If you rip out the foundations, the structure collapses. One of the things that we need to understand is that Genesis is like a foundation and the rest of the Bible is like a structure. 
Because as you study the scripture, you suddenly realize that all of our doctrines, all of our biblical doctrines of theology, ultimately, directly or indirectly, have their foundation in which book? Genesis. All biblical doctrines. And Genesis is like a foundation, the rest is like a structure. Of course, if you rip out a foundation, what's liable to happen to the structure? It's liable to collapse. And when you think about it, if all your doctrine does have its foundation in the book of Genesis, and Genesis, of course, tells us about origins. In fact, if you look at Genesis, it tells you about the origin of life, man, marriage, evil, government, cultures, nations, sin, death, clothing, chosen people, hydrosphere, solar system, atmosphere, and so it goes on and on. The meaning of anything is tied up with its origin. And so if you want to understand the meaning of marriage, for instance, you have to understand its origin. In which book? Genesis. If you want to understand the meaning of clothing, you've got to understand its origin. In which book? Genesis. If you want to understand the meaning of death, you've got to understand its origin. In which book? Genesis. You want to understand the meaning of sin, you've got to understand its origin. In which book? Genesis. You want to understand the uh, meaning of the seven day week, you've got to understand its origin. In which book? Genesis. You get the picture? The meaning of anything is tied up with its origin. And when you understand, therefore, that your doctrines are tied to their origin, their basis in the book of Genesis, to understand your Christian doctrine, you must understand the foundation. You must understand the basis. If you rip out the basis, then the understanding goes. It starts to collapse. Isn't it true that one of the things we're trying to do too, as parents, and for those of you who are going to be parents, when you have children, is to have that structure in the next generation? You want them to have those same doctrines? You want them to understand Christianity? If you want to build a structure in the next generation, you've got a problem if you're trying to build a structure without a foundation because a structure without a foundation won't stand. And as I look around this nation, Australia today, and I've preached in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, and I've preached thousands of times, stayed with hundreds of people. You know, you know one of the things I notice? In the next generation, by and large, that structure is not standing. It's collapsing. And one of the reasons I believe it's collapsing is because the foundation hasn't been laid for the structure to stand. See, if you take the average carpenter, you know how he builds a house, don't you? He starts from the roof and then he builds the walls and... Is that right? Of course not. He starts from the foundation up. Unfortunately, many parents try to build a structure in the next generation from the roof down instead of the foundation up. And they wonder why it doesn't stand. Or, you know, if you don't give the foundation and uh, they go along to school or college and they get a different foundation called evolution, then it's not going to allow that structure to stand anyway because it's the wrong foundation for that structure. What really is the difference between creation and evolution? I believe it comes down to this. I believe the bottom line is this. If there's a creator, and there is, it means he owns you. It means you're under total obligation to him. He has a right to set the rules which you must obey regardless of your opinion. And in reality, when it comes to the ultimate basis of your thinking, nothing is a matter of your opinion. On the other hand, if you believe you're a product of chance random processes, let's be logical. If there's no God, who owns you? No one. Who sets the rules? You do. Who decides what's right and what's wrong? You do. You know, in the book of Judges, it says concerning the Israelites, when they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. When there is no absolute authority, when there is no lawgiver, doesn't Paul tell us God gave the law so we'd know what sin's all about? If there is no lawgiver and therefore there's no law, is there any such thing as sin in people's eyes? The answer is no. And I believe the more that people reject the basis that God is creator, and the more they believe they're just a product of chance random processes, logically in society you'll see a change from people accepting the laws based on the Bible to deciding we can do whatever we want to do, why do we have to obey what you say? And I believe you'd expect to see increasing lawlessness, abortion, homosexuality, pornography. In other words, increasing rejection of the Christian absolutes. And that's exactly what we do see. And I wonder how many people have ever related it to the issue of origins. Because it is related to those foundational issues. A structure only collapses if the foundations are pulled out from under them. And you know, when we're training our children, I remember one man who came to me and he said, my sons rebelled against Christianity. They said, why should we obey your rules? You know, he said, until I listened this morning to what you were saying, I realized I had never taught them that God is the creator, he owns you, he sets the rules. He said, they just saw it as my set of opinions. 
the church's opinions. I hadn't given them the foundation that God was creator. At school they got the foundation of evolution. They decided to have their own opinions. They rejected Christianity. He said, I didn't give them the foundation, so the structure collapsed. You know another way in which this shows up in our church? It shows up this way. People today, and I found it in America as well as here, you can go along to Bible studies, you go to churches, you go to church members' meetings, and they're talking about issues like abortion or homosexuality or women's role in the church or whatever it happens to be. And you hear lots of opinions. Lots of opinions. You know, in regard to abortion, what if my daughter was raped? What if it's going to be deformed? What if the person can't look after it? Well, really, it's up to your own conscience. Let's sum up all these opinions. You know what that sounds like? When they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. You see, it's not a matter of our opinion. It's a matter of, hang on, God's the creator. He sets the rules. Let's understand what it means. Remember the first lecture. All of our thinking must start from there, not from here, from there. And therefore, our thinking must be brought in subjection to that. And it's not a matter of our opinion. I remember at one uh, church school I was at over in uh, Kansas, a student at the end of the lecture I gave got up and he said, you know, you sound very convincing. It sounds very logical. And he said, I can't fault it, but you must be wrong. <laughs> and I said, why is that? He said, because my lecturer in geology believes in evolution. And uh, I know if he was here, he could show me where you're wrong. It's just, I, I can't show you where you're wrong. But I'm sure he could because he's an evolutionist, so you must be wrong. I said, you know, son, even if your lecturer was here, and he said things in geology because I'm not a geologist that I couldn't understand. If what he says conflicts with the Bible, then it's very simple. He's wrong. And I will try to go and get a Christian uh, geologist, a creationist geologist, to point out where he's wrong for you, to find the evidence. And by the way, we don't know everything and never will. So just because he says things sometimes doesn't mean they're answers. All it means is we don't have all the evidence at the moment to know why he's wrong. But the point is if it conflicts with the Bible, he's wrong. When I was teaching in um, a particular church in regard to Christian education, bringing up our children, I was talking about the psychologists. If what the psychologists say about bringing up your children conflicts with the Bible, then they're wrong. It's very simple. You see, we must understand that this is the word of one who knows everything and therefore we must judge everything we say according to what this word says. Unfortunately, many of us approach the Bible the other way. We judge what it says according to what we already believe. And we, then we try to reinterpret it. You know, I was at a, uh, uh, there was a conference in which they were discussing, say, women's role in the church. And I don't want to get into this in, in any way this morning except to give some principles in this regard. I remember they were talking about, we want to ordain women pastors. So somebody gets up and says, well, there are women doctors, women lawyers, there should be women pastors. Somebody else gets up and says, women are equal to men, there should be women pastors. Somebody else gets up and says, women are just as bright as men, there should be women pastors. And I thought to myself, there's three interesting opinions. Why should I believe any of them? How many people said, hang on, God made man, God made woman, God gave us certain roles, God gives us uh, the basis from which we are to work, therefore, what does he say? Not our opinion. And you see, if we don't work from there, then it is just our opinion. And that's in every area of our life. And therefore, if we want to come to the right conclusion about anything, whether it's homosexuality, women's role in the church, abortion, how to bring up your kids, whatever it is, Listen to what people are saying. If it's just opinions, then say to them, why? If they then say, let's start with what the Word of God says and work from there, then that's a different matter. And if our church got back to that, I think we'd solve a lot of our doctrinal problems that we have uh, amongst people. Now, let's just move on very, very quickly and to show you that Evolution does affect people's view, the way that I said. Evolutionists often, when I'm speaking to them, say, oh, that's rubbish. Evolution's got nothing to do with your worldview, hasn't it? Go back in history and have a look. You know some of the things that you find? For instance, you find abortion and evolution have gone hand in hand. For instance, there was a man called uh, Ernest Haeckel. And Ernest Haeckel invented this theory called uh, uh, embryonic recapitulation. And the idea was, and I'm sure many of you have been taught it, hand up those that have been taught in school that when an embryo develops in its mother's womb, it goes through a fish stage with gill slits until it becomes human. Right? Quite a number of you. Do you realise the man who invented that theory was a fraud? Do you realise he made it up? Do you realise he, he uh, doctored the evidence? You see, there are some em uh, embryos that do have uh, gill slits, fish, 
But when it comes to when it comes to humans, that's not true at all. It's not true. You see, that particular man so wanted to believe evolution, he made up this idea. And do you realize the more that people believe that what's in their womb is just a fish or a jellyfish or something like that, that it's just an animal, why shouldn't you cut it up? And you'll find abortion and evolution go hand in hand. In America, there are some abortion clinics that take the girls into the side room and say, now it's just in the fish stage of evolution, so you can cut it up, it's not human. What you believe about where you came from does affect your worldview. Of course, as a Christian, Psalm 139 and, and uh, Psalm 51 and Jeremiah 1, the Bible teaches us at the point of conception you're human, therefore abortion is killing, and that's how it must be viewed, regardless of our opinions. Even things, would you believe, male chauvinism and uh, evolution go hand in hand. Now, of course, there are many people who say, well, uh, how can that be? It's obvious the Bible teaches male chauvinism. You know, men lording it over the women. Well, no, it doesn't, actually. The Bible teaches that men and women are equal. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. It does teach you have different roles, eh? And we'll talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, in New Scientist, volume 22, 29, 1983, page 887, Evelyn Richards comments, in a period when women were beginning to demand the suffrage, higher education and entrance to middle class professions, it was comforting to know that women could never outstrip men. The new Darwinianism scientifically guaranteed it. An evolutionary reconstruction that centres on the aggressive territorial hunting male and relegates the female to submissive domesticity and the periphery of the evolutionary process. In other words, the territorial hunting male, you know the picture of the man dragging the woman back to his cave after he hit her on the head, uh, that sort of thing, that man is superior. And she is saying there how male chauvinism really has its roots in evolution. <coughs> Now, many people have tried to interpret the Bible as saying men can lord it over the woman. But as we'll see in a moment, if you take the Bible uh, at uh, its, uh, what it says, take it literally, it doesn't teach that at all. There are many other issues too. Things like communism, Nazism. Uh, for instance, if you look at Hitler, when Hitler was doing what he did to the Jews, he justified it on what basis? Evolution. We are in this process of the survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and in claw, we are the superior race, therefore we can do whatever we want. And there are many documentations to that effect. You can look at it historically uh, concerning Hitler and evolution. You know, we had a lecturer at Sydney University, he used to be a lecturer in linguistics, Dr. Charles Taylor. He's now retired in, in uh, Brisbane. And some of you here probably know Dr. Charles Taylor. But he was telling me that many of the Chinese students tell him that when they become a Christian, the first thing they say is, oh, so you've now given up evolution. They equate becoming a Christian with giving up evolution because for the communist philosophy, evolution is a foundation which they need and it goes hand in hand. There is no God, therefore. And of course, that's why they teach it in their universities and colleges in communist countries. It's very, very necessary for them. Even things like racism and evolution have gone hand in hand. Want to see a good example? Go down to Tasmania, have a look in the Hobart Museum. It tells you the story about when the first white settlers came to Tasmania, they lined up across that island, and then they shot every Aboriginal they could find. Why? It actually tells you one of the reasons. Because, you see, they're only primitives, and they wouldn't understand white man technology. They're not as advanced as a white man, so get rid of them. You know, I've got a couple of quotes here you might be interested in. For instance, uh, if I can find them here. Stephen Gould from Harvard University tells us that the reason the term mongoloid came into existence and was used to uh, he tells us that the term mongoloid was first applied to mentally defective people because it was commonly believed that the mongoloid race hadn't evolved as far as a Caucasian Right? And that's where the term mongoloid came from in regard to being applied to mentally defective children. Interesting, isn't it? But let me read you this. Stephen Gould in Natural History, April 1980, said uh, concerning, you know, the recapitulation idea that we just talked about with Ernest Haeckel? He said that provided a convenient focus for the pervasive racism of white scientists. They looked to the activities of their own children for comparison with normal adult behaviour in lower races. And he goes on... Sir, uh, Sir Henry Fairfield Osborne, the leading American paleontologist of the first half of the 20th century, said this, 
The Negroid stock is even more ancient than the Caucasian and Mongolian. The standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old of the species Homo sapiens. And you remember when many people used to treat the Negroes in a very, uh, what would you say, while they looked on them as slaves and just the underdog, a lot of that was related to evolution. I still believe that many of the ideas people have about the Australian Aborigines is a reflection of what they're taught at school concerning, ab concerning evolution. I remember one particular school, a teacher said to me, she asked her class, if evolution's true, why don't we see apes evolving into people today? Oh, we do, miss, said the kids, look at the Aborigines. Because you see, they're told that Aborigines are primitive, that we were once primitive and we're no longer primitive. And look around us, you might change your opinion. Uh, therefore, they equate primitive with primitive. You will find, historically, racism and evolution have gone hand in hand. You know, the Bible teaches a totally different picture, doesn't it? In fact, because many people talk about different races and not being at the same level, I like to... There are different definitions of the term race. But I, as a Christian, would prefer to say this, that there's really only one race, in the sense that we have all got the same ancestor Noah, going back to Adam, and it's not that people are in different levels in society in regard to evolution, but that people in society today, the different cultures, have developed, particularly since the time of the Tower of Babel, and that many of them have turned their back on God, and so they've degenerated to where they are in their spiritism or whatever, but they're not primitives on the way up. It's a totally different view of history, isn't it? A totally different view. And it is the Christian view that teaches that all men are equal. And we all have the same problem. It's called sin. And it helps us understand why cultures are in the mess that they are in many of these areas. Do you realize even business methods and evolution go hand in hand? Do you remember when the National Bank in Australia merged with another bank and they're now called the National Australia Bank? The magazine they put out to commemorate this merger said, we believe in evolution, we believe in Darwinianism, we believe in survival of the fittest. That is why we've merged. They used evolution to justify their merger. There are many businessmen in America that use evolution to justify why they can eliminate the weak, get rid of them, we can do what we want to do, walk over them. It's evolution, therefore. You see, what you believe about where you came from does affect your worldview. If you believe it's Adam and your ancestry, then of course God sets the rules. If it's ape in your ancestry, everything's relative, you can set the rules, you can do what you want. And what you do is a reflection of what you believe about where you came from. When I look at the world around today then and I see these things, I see the increase in homosexuality and abortion and violence and I see the rejection of the absolutes of Christianity. As a Christian I say it's sin in human heart, in the human heart that's the cause and the rejection of God as creator, not animal in your ancestry. But of course people justify animal in their ancestry to say <coughs> they can do whatever they want to do. Now, let's look at just a couple of things there in more detail as Christians so that we can then tie all this up for you. As Christians, why do we believe what we do? Simply because God is creator and he sets the rules. When it comes to all of our doctrine, as I said, it's found in the book of Genesis. And let's look at two in specifically here. Let's consider marriage, for instance. In Matthew 19, when Jesus was asked a question concerning divorce, it concerned marriage. What did he say? Haven't you read he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they'll be one flesh. Where did he quote from? Genesis. By the way, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 in the same verse. So he didn't believe there were two conflicting accounts of creation. He took them both authoritatively. They are two accounts of creation in a sense. It's just that Genesis 2 is a more detailed account of certain aspects of Genesis 1. And that's all it is. But what he was saying was, you want to understand what marriage is all about? You go back to where it came from because where it came from determines the rules. God took dust and made Adam, took his side and made a woman. You become one when you're married because you're one flesh historically. That's what oneness is all about. I remember at school of one of the women teachers in the next room was saying to the kids, when you get married, girls, remember, you're an individual and you've got your rights. And in my class, I would say, when you get married, remember, you're one with your husband and God has total right over your life anyway. That's a big conflict, isn't it, for the kids, <laughs> when you think about it. When it comes to the issue of homosexuality, you know, it's very easy to solve when you get back to the foundational basis. It's not a matter of your opinion. God made marriage. God made man and woman. He made Adam and Eve. 
not Adam and Bruce. He made a man and a woman. Not a man and a man. Actually, I said that at a big church in Illinois recently and the congregation went into convulsions. And uh, later on I found out that their minister was Dr. Bruce Dunn. But uh, <laughs> one of those embarrassing moments. When it comes to the role of men and the role of women, I know the feminists are out there demanding equality. Well, I don't really think they are. If you read their writings, I think they're demanding supremacy. But they say they're demanding equality. Well, it's not a matter of equality because the Bible teaches that men and women are equal, but it teaches you have different roles. And what I'd ask you is this, ladies and gentlemen, are you prepared to accept the role God ordained for you regardless of your opinion? And to be honest, I'm not interested in your opinions anyway. Because it's, <laughs> it's not a matter of your opinion. You see the point? And you see, we could go to the scripture and look at things like this. It says, Adam was created first, Eve was deceived, a woman will be in submission to her husband. End of argument. Now, it also says that husbands and wives are submit to each other too. But it's talking about a role in marriage, isn't it? A role for men and a role for women. You see, it goes on to say about uh, husbands, it says, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I wonder how many husbands love their wives like that. It goes on to say Ephesians 6 and you read in Proverbs and Isaiah 38, 19, it's quite obvious. The fathers to the children are to make known thy truth. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. The scripture teaches over and over again, fathers are to be spiritual head. You know, in the majority of Christian homes, who is it that trains a kid spiritually, mum or dad? The answer is mum. I find that everywhere I preach in Australia and America. And you know what you often see? You often see this, and I say this as a generalisation only, from my experience, where the fathers haven't taken on their headship role and trained the daughters. You often see the daughters dating non-Christian fellas, marry non-Christian husbands and get in a mess. You often see the sons rebelling against Christianity having nothing to do with church, even if the daughters still do. Now I see that as a generalisation. I've had many women come up to me. Had one woman, one place she came up and said, you know, when I was dating my husband, I compared him to my father and I saw no difference. But my father was a Christian, my husband wasn't. She didn't see the difference because the husband hadn't taken on the headship role. She said, when I married him, now we're in such a mess because we've got this big conflict with the kids and church and everything else. And there are many, many women in that position. And a lot of it does relate to the way they've been trained. You know, if you take away the foundation, the structure collapses. Of course, for those non-Christians who believe in marriage and, and uh, believe one man for one woman, ask them why. What if your son comes home and says, hey, Dad, I'm going to marry Bill. You can't do that, son. Why not? It's not right. Why isn't it right? It's wrong. Why is it wrong? Shouldn't do it. Why not? It's not right. <coughs> ah, Dad, it's okay in New South Wales. Isn't that right? Even churches will marry them. You see, you can have all sorts of opinions, but if you don't have a basis for it, how can you say the next generation should have the same opinion, so to speak? Let's look at one other issue. We could talk about marriage for a long time, but we haven't got time. Let's look at, say, clothing. I notice today that you're all wearing clothes. Well, that's, that's really good. Now, uh, tell me, why are you wearing clothes? Because outside's pretty cold. <laughs> you know, if you use that opinion, and that's all it is, that it's cold, does that mean when it's hot you take your clothes off? And if I come back in the hot weather, I'll see something very different. I would hope not. See, the reason you wear clothes is not because it's an opinion. It's because there's a moral reason as to why you wear clothes. And guess which book you have to go back to to find out? Genesis, of course. That took a lot of hard work guessing that, didn't it? And when you go back to Genesis, you find God made Adam and Eve. They were naked. They rebelled against God. Sin came into the world. Sin destroys nakedness. Sin distorts nakedness, sorry. Sin distorts anything. Now, God gave coats. He killed animals. The first blood sacrifice is a covering for our sin. Very uh, interesting picture, isn't it? He gave coats, complete coverings. Now, let's get realistic and honest. You see, men respond to a woman's body sexually very, very, very easily. Don't they, men? Yeah, some are nodding, some are smiling, some are looking down. I said that at a minister's conference once, and one young minister jumped up and said, Amen. Hang <laughs> <laughs> out to talk to him later, of course. But, you know, men were created that way, but it was to be in response to one woman, their wife, in a perfect relationship, but now sin distorts that, and fellows do have a problem called lust, which is why they're singled out in the New Testament. It says if a man lusts after a woman in his heart, he commits adultery in his heart. And in other words, whatever a woman wears or doesn't wear, by the way, can put a stumbling block on a man's way and cause him to commit adultery in his heart. 
Which, by the way, is no excuse for the males. You know what Job said? You should have a covenant with your eyes. You mightn't be able to help the first look, but you can the second. And what you do with that look, you can help. So there's no excuse for you anyway. But what you do wear, ladies, can put a stumbling block in a man's way. You know what happens in many homes? You're not going to wear that daughter, why not? It's not right, why isn't it right? You shouldn't wear it, why not? Because it's wrong, why is it wrong? You shouldn't wear that, why not? Because it's not right, why is it right? So it goes on. Ah, oh, mum and dad, you're old-fashioned. You know what that means? Mum and dad, that's your opinion. I've got my opinion. You go jump in the lake. But you see, it's not a matter of your opinion. What a difference it makes when you say, daughter, hang on, let's go back to where clothing came from. Clothing came because of sin. Let's understand what men are like. Let's understand what uh, sin's done to nakedness. Uh, now, you know that I've already trained you that God is creator and he sets the rules. You know that all of our doctrine goes back to Genesis and so on. So, therefore, let's develop a standard of clothing in accord with why God gave clothing in the first place. And now you wear what I tell you to because I'm your parent anyway. <laughs> you see, the difference is you've given a foundation for the structure. You know, what I'm telling you is this. If you have a creation basis, you know what the laws are and marriage and standards, why you wear clothes, you know what life's all about. On the other hand, if you believe in evolution, you reject the God of creation, why not write your own laws? Why not be homosexual? Why not take your clothes off? Why not cut a baby up by abortion? In other words, what we see happening in society today in the collapse of these things, of marriage, of, of Christian uh, standards, of, of the laws based on the Bible, of the meaning of life and so on, is this. When you remove the foundation, the structure collapses. This foundation here, which is so prevalent, so taught through our school system and education system and through the media, the more that people believe that, the more that these things will become prevalent. And they are. And that's what you see. Now you're going to say to me, are you blaming evolution, therefore, for the ills in society? My answer is no. Yes. Well, yes and no. Because you know what the real reason is? The real reason is the rejection of God as creator. When people reject the God of creation, they say, we can do whatever we want to do. But what is the so-called scientific justification today for people rejecting the God of creation? Evolution. I believe evolution is one of the biggest stumbling blocks to today's people being receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so evolution really is the cause in a sense. In fact, if you don't believe in creation, there's only one other alternative, evolution. Darwin didn't invent evolution. Darwin popularized it. The Greeks believed in evolution. Evolution goes all the way back. In fact, I believe back to the Garden of Eden, when what did the serpent say? You can become as gods. What's that if it's not evolution? If you think about it, you don't have to accept that God has a right over you. You yourself can be a god. Let me sum up what I'm saying for you in, in these two overheads, and then we'll finish this particular section. Here's a castle called humanism, founded on evolution. Here are all these issues, homosexuality, abortion, etc. And of course, that's what that is, humanism. That's what humanism is. Over here we have the creation foundation, this castle called Christianity. And you know, here's the battle as I see it. The evolutionists in our society are very clever. They know what to do. Fight the battle where it's at. Knock out the foundation, the structure will collapse. And it is. What do the Christians do? Well, they do a lot of shooting at each other. You can, uh, <laughs> you can even go into some churches where you see, you know, the cannons lined up across the aisle and three or four aimed at the pulpit as well. Or they shoot out here into nowhere. Or they take pot shots at the issues. You know what I mean by pot shots at the issues? I mean the number of people that are out there fighting even issues like abortion and homosexuality. Why? Because it's wrong, because it's not right, because it's wrong, because it's not right, because it's wrong, because it's not right. You know, you can fight in regard to abortion all you like. And even if you did get the laws changed, and you're not liable to in Australia at the moment, but in America maybe they will, but even if they did, what happens when the next generation comes through who so believes evolution, the reason it became popular anyway, and so reject creation, won't they just change the laws back again? In other words, it, words it's no good just fighting up here. We've got to get back down to here. And we've got to fight it at a foundational level. If you want that structure to collapse, destroy that foundation, evolution. If you want this structure to stand, rebuild that foundation. And you know, so many ch churches say, creation, evolution, society issue, ignore it, let's just preach the gospel. What's the gospel anyway? We'll be talking about that in another session. The gospel starts with the message of creation. But if you don't rebuild that foundation, that structure will collapse. You know, in, a, in Australia, I see that structure collapsing in many areas. 
And the reason I believe it's collapsing is because of this. Christians need to re-aim their guns. Creation evolution is not a side issue. I believe it is one of the most vital and foundational issues today. Here's another summary. Here we have a submarine called Evolution and Humanism. And here we have a boat called Christianity with a hole called Creation. And you notice what's happening. The ev evolution torpedoes have hold SS Creation. The boat's sinking and the Christians are bailing it out and looking everywhere trying to figure out what's happening. They don't realise it's a foundational attack. They don't realise what's happening underneath. Do you know the majority of Bible colleges and theological colleges in this nation teach that evolution can be added to the Bible or it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis? I can say that because I've visited many and we've written to them and we know what they've said. Do you know the majority of churches in this nation, the preachers would tell their congregation it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis or you can believe in evolution. Some of the most ardent opposition to our ministry comes from the church, certain aspects of the church. Now, there are those churches that stand up for creation. There are those Bible colleges that do too. Like, for instance, this one here. But sadly, you're in an extremely, extremely small minority in this nation. You know, in America, if I was to count the number of churches that actually, uh, sorry, number of theological and Bible colleges that actually teach creation and teach the importance of Genesis, I think you could probably count them on your right hand, the fingers of your right hand. Very, very small number extremely small number and that's very sad creation evolution is not just a side issue it's a foundational issue and that's why we see the whole area is so important we're going to take that up in uh, one of the future sessions that we're going to do thank you